He's the smartest guy I've ever met. But I mostly hang out with nightclub comics. So I don't know <laughs> if that's in anything. But anyways, Jim, how you doing, pal? Norm, it's so good to hear your voice. <laughs> Why do you say that? Uh, because you're supposed to, right? <laughs> like this. So what do you no, want? I, 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 I'm a big fan of Norm MacDonald, uh, America. <laughs> Jim and I worked together on a weekend update and got Best fired update together. update ever in the history of television. Absolutely. And we got fired together. That's right. <laughs> Uh, which just only confirmed it in the minds of people like me. <laughs> but Norm, yes. you know, you said a few minutes ago when I was listening, you brought up Iran Contra, and I actually just wanted to underscore uh, the point you made that you weren't confident uh, enough in, which was that, um, you know, when people talk about Iran Contra, they they always talk about the rape of the Constitution and the shredding of you know the Bill of Rights, and and our founding fathers are rolling over in their graves, and. The, the issue at stake in Iran-Contra was this thing called the Boland Amendment, which was passed, I think, like in the 80s or late 70s. And it, the administration at the time said this is, it was basically a Congress saying that the president uh, couldn't do certain things in, in terms of his war powers and without their approval. And the uh, Reagan administration at the time said, uh, this is ridiculous, this is unconstitutional bill, you cannot... The Constitution clearly, you know, gives the president these powers, and it was disputed but never challenged in court. So this was this was a like a three or four year old, five year old uh, amendment that had that would never been uh, accepted by the other branch of government, and it wasn't. We weren't talking about tearing up the Constitution. In any case, what they did was they they uh, uh, got money by selling arms to like the ninth worst regime on earth to use against the seventh worst regime on earth, made a profit, gave it to the Contras, got the hostages released, and the Contras later won the election uh, it, that Jimmy Carter supervised, so uh, they must have at least been a little more popular than the Sandinistas. So I agree. I think if, if, if most things that uh, the Bush administration had done worked anywhere near that well, he'd be a very popular man right now. Wow, so Jim anyway, agrees with so You me. were right. <laughs> but uh, not for the right reasons. Hey, uh, Jim, I, I couldn't get that answer from that la- from Ken, but uh, why is Ahmadinejad more powerful than Abel Hassam Banny Sadder? <laughs> well, um, now I, I haven't kept it all straight, but you know that Bonnie Sadder was, was uh, executed by the regime like just a year or two after the hostages came out, or maybe even before they were released. And it was his there wife, too? There was a period too? there where, remember, there was Sadak Gotsbade, who was the more westernized spokesman but no. they were going through prime ministers and and uh you know ministers of state and so on uh, pretty quickly there there uh, that was a crazy regime still is but now is this new is this Khamenei guy also the spiritual leader well you know i i, I have to say i i thought i thought myself that there there was a new ayatollah since then uh but a grand ayatollah but i i i can't i have to plead ignorance Ah, oh, shoot. I'm missing a lot of things. Where does that leave us, then? Uh, SOL, my friend. <laughs> you know, but, Jim's um, an actor as well. Yes, I know. I've seen him in... Uh, oh, in uh, There Will there Be Blood. There Will Be Blood. Will be blood yeah. That was fantastic. Jim, I keep telling everybody that, that Daniel Day-Lewis is just doing an impression of uh, John Huston. Well, I think, I think he might have, uh, you know, been inspired by by that but uh um he was great though oh he's I fantastic yeah. i mean he won the oscar I know. so that proves it right <laughs> did nothing wrong did he stay great in character man. uh in between the was he always in character um pretty was he one of those experience yeah um we would we would ride back and forth you know uh to the to the scene because the the set where where we shot it was was on a ranch but uh, a gigantic ranch of many thousand acres, and it was so. Uh, they've had like a thirty-year drought there, and it was so uh, dusty that we couldn't drive more than like ten miles an hour or something. It was like creeping along. Otherwise, mm-hmm. anything else would kick up huge amounts of dust. And so we were, we'd be in the car for these long rides, and he he pretty much stayed in character for you know talking conversations about like weekends and stuff. Uh, he's an interesting guy. I liked him a lot. Huh. Uh, so how would he talk? And <laughs> how would he talk? Well, he, he, 
I'd say like, um, so uh, we got a three-day break, I guess, so are you going to try to do anything interesting? Well, I, I was going to go to Carlsbad Caverns, but uh, I think I might stay closer to home. <laughs> that burger, to it's the best burger I ever had. <laughs> you know, it's just funny to hear that voice uh, come out of that, that uh, face. That's great. But um, so Norm on Iran Contra, don't yeah. uh, don't apologize. <laughs> hey Jim. Yeah. You know I was mentioning how great you were and everything. Yeah, thanks so much. And and how you saved the show every four years. Yeah, I bet they like hearing that. But um, <laughs> but yeah. that's what you feel too, right? Yes. <laughs> I think I'm. I you know I certainly make my contribution. And because I saw a book, I, I was I was in a bookstore. I know you're familiar with bookstores. Oh, yeah. You're not one of these fellows that go on Amazon. I bet you probably aren't computer savvy like me, like I am not. I'm not really computer savvy because I, I, I really believe they're Satan's uh, uh, instrument. And uh, you're, you're, ser- you're serious, right? Um, absolutely. You know me and Satan. No, I, I, um, I just haven't really gotten around to it. Oh, you so know? you don't see that, that, that they're I don't. I don't really... Uh, go online and and use computers and stuff but anyways i was gonna say i was in a bookstore and i saw there's a book actually called strategery yeah i saw that yeah and that you made that up i did make that up i should have copyrighted it like three peat you know (laughs) then i'd uh i could have made i don't know a couple hundred bucks maybe didn't they actually start using that term i think that they started using that term as part of their they 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 sort of they liked it and, and adopted it, and they would they would call their meetings strategic sessions. And I know Rush Limbaugh used it a lot. You know a um, term they use, Steve? I mean, uh, Jim, a lot. Hmm. Remember when I would start the the weekend update? I go, "This is the fake news because it was such a retarded right. thing to say." Now they say instead of mock news, they actually say fake news. Like they'll say, "Like uh, Stephen Colbert does a fake news program," or you know what I mean. Well, yeah, and then you and me are in the same boat. We got to get a lawyer. <laughs> but in right? this case, in the fake news case, it's it's just idiotic that they that they use it because it was meant to be uh, sort of silly. Well, um, you know, so I, obviously, I didn't think that I, I was sort of surprised that the Bush people liked strategery too. They, they, um, but you know, people have. What do you mean, the Bush people? Well, that that it it wasn't. I mean. It was sort of making fun of him, of course, uh, when I put that word in his mouth in that sketch. But but they like loved it. They thought it was the greatest thing ever. So um, that's why they they themselves started calling their their uh, morning meeting strategic sessions. I guess. Huh. Now, do you think that's because George Bush is just contemptuous of? I I don't think so. I think they just they just have embraced sort of self deprecation. You know. I, I I think that uh, that's always been his response to being made fun of, right? Who are you to, supporting, to Barack? Own it. Um, I well, you know what? I actually this year I, I kind of like both uh, candidates uh, for very different reasons. I mean, you know, Barack Obama. It's hard to argue is is like the first really cool guy who's run for president in our like sentient lifetimes. I mean, you know, you weren't probably alive, and and I was a, a tiny kid when. Uh, JFK. Well, but but I, I I was but I was a uh, I was a young man when Pierre Trudeau, right? Yeah, who was very cool. Yeah, and it, it is it is uh, it's it's an actual value. I mean, it uh, it would certainly be more fun to travel in Europe, I would think, uh, when Obama is president. But you know, on the other hand, McCain has a uh, there's a lot to admire about him, although we're not seeing as much of it as we. We saw eight years ago when he ran um, for the nomination. You know? You know, but I, I did see him like on C-SPAN the other night doing one of these town hall meetings, and the guy's exceptional at one-on-one speaking with someone. Well, yeah, I mean, his, 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 that's where you can most impress people by straight talk, you know, because you're it's face-to-face with, with uh, someone. And it's, it's, uh, now, if Obama was doing that face-to-face, would he come off as... Dogmatic or no? I think I think he I think Obama is great at every single form of communication. He's great at the big speech, you know, the the rock rock and roll kind of thing in the arena, and he's he's great in um, 
you know, the smaller town hall things. It, they said it, it, in debates he wasn't, uh, he wasn't as good, but I, I think that, that he just wasn't as aggressive in debates, which is another thing. And, and I'm not sure that people uh, necessarily want people to be that, that uh, uh, aggressive. Yeah. You, you don't want to come down. You don't. You don't want him, You're afraid he's going to look like Jim Brown or something if he. <laughs> well, no. Is that no, what you're I saying? Just, I just. I don't mean that at all. I just mean that that you know, in in the debates like with with Hillary, where where she was going after him more, um, and, and people said, well, he seemed on the defensive. But that's just because he was he was sort of trying to deflect and not land any punches, and and I, I think he was sort of um, aware that. Uh, uh, if he just stayed cool, he he had a lead and he was going to end up winning. You know, I mean, he had, it was a brilliant strategy. He ran for the nomination. I mean, if you think about it, uh, he he was such a long shot, and he just he just figured that uh, um, he will he will clean up in all these little places uh, where uh, the Hillary Clinton won't bother to invest any resources. And then, you know, so I I read somewhere the other day that he. Um, like Idaho, <laughs> you should probably have no Democratic delegates since they're not going to be able to deliver anything for the Democrats. But um, they had like 14 delegates or something, and Obama won, I think, 13 of them, you know? Wow. Hmm. And, and he, then he would lose a state like New Jersey to Hillary, but lose by like 12 delegates. So, you know, it was a brilliant... I mean, Hillary probably could have, could have blown him away had she just, you know... Uh, taken the thing much more seriously in the beginning and just made sure that she was going to crush the opposition in every single arena. Hey, Jim, can you stay for another section? If you'll have me. I call them sections. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we'll be back with our next section. Hi, Norm McDonald filling in for Dennis Miller on The Dennis Miller Show. The number to call is 866-509-RANT, 866-509-7268. If you have any questions for uh, <clears throat> Jim Downey, who is a fascinating guy and uh, was there since the, I don't know if it's quite since the beginning of Saturday Night Live, but it's close to, shared an office with Bill Murray, didn't you, Jim? Yes. Oh, yes. The second season, I came the second season, same time Bill did. Oh, yeah, yeah. But listen, man, Steve has a question for you. It's all right if, if America has no questions. I'm not, I'm not a head. <laughs> no, America, America's going to be... <laughs> our, our things might crash. Don't things crash? But Steve uh, has a question, a political question. Okay. Just you're so well informed, I'm just curious what your opinion is. With uh, Obama, he's such a great speaker, but how do we know he's more than a great speaker and maybe it doesn't matter i mean maybe a, being a great speaker is enough to just motivate the country what do you think about that um well you know the thing is uh in in a way as president being a great speaker is is more of a qualification than um than having a great uh you know issue agenda because an issue agenda can be supplied by really smart unattractive behind the scenes people right but to sell something like like I thought one of Bush's one of crazy things truly really crazy things that Bush did was when you do when you have like an unpopular agenda like a war in Iraq that that we started right you damn well better have a, a like a kick ass uh, persona to sell it you know and to 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 pair like an unpopular initiative with an awkward and inarticulate uh, defender right. of that of that initiative is is like the worst of everything. Like in Clinton, you had almost the opposite, where he would he was playing it so safe he would he would push really like tiny uh, miniature little little uncontroversial things that poll tested at like sixty percent. But then he had you know a much he was much better at selling things than right. than uh, George W. Bush is, and and I'm not saying that 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 someone like Barack Obama could have totally sold uh, Americans on the Iraq war, but they would have, he would have done a much better job because, you know, uh, they, uh, uh, clearly, I mean, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, uh, I know before we went in, 
I'm pretty sure that it was the public was slightly against. It was it was like you know, right, forty nine, forty six, or something. Um, only when it only was really popular when it looked like it was easy. You know, the first couple months, right, and then it's been you know. But it was. I, I'll give Bush this at least that that he wasn't afraid to do something unpopular. But the problem is, you really, you know, presidents need to be uh, eloquent and they they need to be articulate because they have to. If they're going to do anything worthwhile, it's going to probably be unpopular with at least a, a, a decent chunk of the population, and, and you have to be you have to be able to sell it. Hey Jim, yeah, <laughs> are you and Steve done with your gab fest? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right, we're like a couple of chatterboxes. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. A couple of that's just a hen house horse. Hey, we're going to go to break, but then we got all these questions for you, Jim. So you'll stick around, right? All right. Okay. Cool. This is the Dennis Miller Show. Dennis is on assignment. Norm McDonald reporting. Uh, we have with us Jim Downey, who uh, is uh, probably, other than Lauren, the uh, most important thing to the success of that show throughout the years. He's been there since near inception. And uh, so if you have any questions about Saturday Night Live, this would be the guy to ask. So uh, give us a call at 866 866- 509 rant that's 866-509-7268 for those of you that weren't listening 866-509-7268 hey jim it's yeah. Stevie here when you started on saturday night live it was the second year of the show right right so they were still doing all the the cocaine and the drugs well, it got and good the, the second year you know <laughs> that's right that, that is where the the famous year uh, but what? How long did those drug years last? Like, when did that stop? Like all the the wild, crazy. I, it wasn't. It wasn't particularly uh, wild and crazy. I think to the really? extent that stuff like that happened, it was more uh, to stay awake than it was to you know have a good time. And and I I think it it that stuff was pretty much gone by like the third season. You know, uh, it, you know it's it's. It's just because of the you know spectacular Belushi story. Uh, right. it, it has a lot of uh, um, you know that's been etched into the consciousness, but uh, it really was not much of a feature of the I show. I see. That's interesting because even at the time he was extreme, so I guess that sort of colors what the whole world must have been like. Well, yeah. I mean, he was um, he was you know one of a kind, and and, and obviously his his most destructive he was one was after he left the show. You know. He was one of a kind. Yeah. What about Wasn't Jim he? Belushi? <laughs> there was a, there was Jim Belushi. Jim is is very close, and actually, Jim Belushi, let me say, is one of the best actors who's ever been on that show. Wow. I mean, if you ever saw Jim in like uh, Salvador or, or something, he's a really good actor. Um, uh-huh. Hey, Jim, do you mind and talking? John was too, huh? Do you mind talking to the uh, the hoy polloi, as you call them? <laughs> As I, I, well, I'd like to dismiss them as the white point. Like, listen, Norm, I want to make clear to the audience that yeah. I haven't been at the show every single year. I tend to come and go, and certainly if well, there no, was you a had to leave. didn't like, I was not there. You had to leave to create uh, the David Letterman show. You bet. That's right. We have a question from Gary in Saginaw, Michigan. Okay. You want to hear it? I'd love to hear Gary's question. Hey, Gary, what's up? Norm, first of all, I want to tell you what a pleasure it is to talk to you, first of all. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's very exciting for me. Thanks for filling in for Dennis, man. I love Saturday Night Live. I love your movies. Ah, you're sweet. Uh, uh, you're, you're a heck of a guy, man. I love your kind of humor. You know, there's, there's not very many norms around in this world, and we need more, but uh, I'm happy with you. So uh, how's it going? Uh, it's going great, man, but I thought you were going to ask Jim a question. Yeah, yeah, I got one for him, too, but I want to talk the whole stuff. <laughs> That's nice, man. You're a good man. So, uh, Jim, uh, what do you got poking in the fire? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm hoping this goes really well, and, and I, could, I could do another uh, couple of uh, sections of Dennis's show. Maybe I'm not, not with Dennis right away. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that, but, you know... Uh, uh, certainly, Norm. I think Norm would have me back, right, Norm? Hey, listen, man. Uh, I'd have you back well. anytime. But um, sit, but I don't think that's no, what I'm, he, I'm, I don't I'm think that's really, what he I, meant. I'm gonna, I'm, I don't think um, that's what he meant when he said. Back at the show. I'm going to be back at the show next fall. 
Uh, and they just issued the schedule and, and uh, what sketches are you got working on? You, you don't. I, don't I mean, it's probably it's going to be um, uh, mostly political stuff for the fall because they. Uh, God bless him. Lauren uh, is starting a month earlier than we usually start, and starting with four in a row, which is something you've never done. I'll, I'll bet, Norm. I've never done four. So we're in going a row. on September thirteenth. We're going to be on for the next four weeks, with one week off and then three weeks. Wow! So it's going to be uh, we're we're going to be dead. If you're going to do four in a row, you're not going to have much time for poking around in the fire. <laughs> no, no, that's a terrible way to find ideas too. It's like one, two, three, four, five. Six. I was just looking at. We have like. Seven shows before the election, plus three primetime Thursday specials. That's wow. ten wow. different elements of pre-election stuff. Hey, you want to take another question from what? Well, that's you, what I'm going to be doing. You want to take another question from what you refer to as the uh, great unwashed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it on radio that would be okay, right? Yeah. I, can't, I can't get hurt on radio. This is okay. Gary from New Mexico. Oh, great. I like the land of hey, enchantment. Hey, how's it going? The land of what, Gary? The land of enchantment, right? land of enchantment. Yeah, it's beautiful over here. It's been raining every afternoon. It just couldn't, couldn't be better. Life's great over here, just like another day in paradise. It's great. And I just wanted to say, hey, Norm, uh, man, thanks for all the many, many laughs. You're, you're, you're tops in my book. Anyway, my question is, uh, which comedian was the is the best and 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 is the most genuine and truly great to work with uh on you know as far as uh, being nice off the set during you know during takes and all that stuff who's the best comedian to, to work with who's the sweetest comedian you mean a, a woman right 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 yeah comedian i'll bet norm's gonna say roseanne right <laughs> <laughs> no seriously wouldn't you norm yeah i love roseanne yeah. yeah i like her too i've always had a great time i our, but this is was directed at Norm, right? No, no, it was directed at you about the... Uh, well, comedian in, in... I guess he means, like, not people who've been in our cast. At the no, show, he, members, but, he means people that have been in the cast. Oh, well, I mean, I, let me say that... I would say that that the last couple of years... Uh, now, now, Maya Rudolph has left the show, but I would say at the time when we had Maya Rudolph and, and uh, Amy Poehler and, and uh, uh, Kristen Wiig, I would say... Those three, easily the best group of women. There's no other group of women comes close as far Boy, as... Kristen Wiig, I saw her do something on Update. I don't know what it was, but she talked real fast. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Man, that was a real tour good. de force. Yeah, yeah but, but that, I'd say that group of women um, as a group, it's, it's the best the show's ever had. And, and, uh, uh, and, and the new uh, girl, Casey Wilson, is great, too. And she's going to be right up there. She's just starting out. But, um, she's the heavier lady. But, well, she's no, but but she's a new girl. But but the, no, the, I meant um, heavyweight. What do you think? What are you talking about? No, but but the why does but everything over the, have to over go? the years of the show? There have never been uh, uh, there's never been a group like that. There have been individual uh, women here and there, and 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 of the we you know normally have we ever had many women hosts who are comedians as opposed to actresses? I don't think we've had that many. No. I mean, Ro- Roseanne Barr is. Uh, is well, the only we, one we I had really coming to mind. Yeah, huh? we had, yeah, we had Roseanne, and and Ellen DeGeneres was was I, I think it's really funny. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, you nice. don't think women are as funny as men, right? Um, <laughs> I I do. I think that men are much more interested as as a as you know, generally speaking, in comedy, and and uh, it's you know the norm is more guys trying to make girls laugh than the reverse, right? So. So, I mean, I think that's why men tend to predominate in comedy. But, um, that, I mean, you know, the, there's always plenty of openings. For, Who is for a great woman writer? Funny. Name five great women writers on Saturday Night Live. Um, I would say uh, right now we have Paula Pell, who's great. Uh, we have... Um, uh, hey, you want to take what? a call from Joel <laughs> Wait a minute. in Kansas City? Me- no, I don't uh, want to embarrass you. You're having trouble getting past one. <laughs> I'm not. Here's Joel from Kansas City. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. Jamma, yes. I hope you're no relation to uh, Robert Sr. or Jr. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, complicated. Okay, uh, I won't go there. But I don't hey, I've been go a great it. fan of the show since 72, and I've never, never gotten a straight answer other than Lauren's genius. But why is it? That every time the group changes, I can't stand them. 
the show has gone to pot. It's awful. And two years later, they're the best ever. How could they do this for 35 years? Well, did I you work on I the show it, in 1972, Jim? <laughs> well, <laughs> I was on the air there. Now, give him a break. Now, I, I would say that if that hasn't always worked, but um, there was like we had a really bad group uh, that that I had nothing to do with the picking of. But in 1985, that 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 was kind of a disastrous season. But I would say in general, it's true because people people um, just sit on their hands and sort of resent the new people and, and need to be won over. Hey, and, Jim. Uh, it takes people a year or two to find their footing. Yeah, Jim, the show. Jim, that's, that's cool, man. Listen, Bryce has a great question, and it's a question that I've always wondered about. Bryce, are you there? Hey, I am, man. How you doing? Good, man. Hey. He's from the Mile hey. High City, Jim. Well, I'm oh, my God. You, it's, uh, so this is like a Western theme. It, it really sucks here, so all these Californians and Texans can go back home. Yeah. Uh, hey, I quit watching TV when they canceled your show, Norm. Uh, I want you to know. <laughs> quit watching TV? Yeah, I quit watching TV when they canceled your show. Oh, that's nice. So did that you. Uh, a lot I, I got a question for Steve. Was Pat a man or a woman? Pat was... Yeah, it was Pat a man or a woman? Pat was a man. Pat was a man. And uh, I think that should have been obvious to anyone who who really watched Farley the show told carefully. Me. Chris Farley told me it was a woman. Maybe it was a woman. It might have been a woman. <laughs> he said it was Pat could have been a woman. He said it was played by some broad. Pat was played by uh, a, a woman, Julia Sweeney, who created the character. Oh, well, she's a woman then. Okay. A woman, but no, but he means conceptually what was Pat uh, uh, meant to be in reality. And I think, I think Pat was a man. That's just a theory. That makes sense because it was played by a woman, so he was a, fe- a very feminine man. Yeah, it seems like otherwise, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, it, she could could have been a woman too. So uh, I hope I've I've covered that. <laughs> Norm, you cut me off when I was naming my favorite women writers. I didn't get to say Emily Spivey, who's who's there right now, who's a genius. Uh, you're just naming people that are Pam on this. Pam Norris, sh- huh? You're- no, Pam Norris was was a writer like 20 years ago. Okay, keep going. That's three. Okay, go. Rosie Schuster. Yeah. Uh, I'm just. Uh, well, um, That's four. <laughs> Tina Fey is a great writer, but I think of her now as a performer. But she's a very good writer. Well, that's five. Uh, that's you did five. it, you Jim. Know? You did it. You did it. <laughs> oh, I could. I could go on and on. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Let's do ten then. <laughs> let's no. Let's let's. Because uh, then I'm just going to piss off people I don't name. If, All right, if Jim. We'll we'll take a break and let and we'll let you collect your thoughts. Okay. <laughs> Donald, sitting in for Dennis Miller on the Dennis Miller Show. I'm here with Stevie Ray Fromstein, and uh, we're still talking to Jim Downey, who's been kind enough to stay with us. Jim Downey's a he's a pundit, <laughs> and he's a yeah. writer, but I want to talk about his acting career, because Jim's a great actor, and uh, on Saturday Night Live, he created, uh, he did Change Bank, which was a very funny uh, sketch. And uh, he sometimes casts himself when he thinks it's the right choice to make. Once every ten, every ten or fifteen years, yeah. I, I cast myself. But then you have guys like Paul Thomas Anderson and uh, Bob Saget and directors like that. that, <laughs> that That's right. Uh, Tamara Tamara Davis. Tamara Davis. So. Yeah, so so I, I take my shot. But, but what was you know? your best performance, serious, honest to God, in film? What was it? I know the answer, but dirty work. Um, I well, the one that people seem to talk about at all <laughs> was uh, was uh, uh, Billy Madison. Yeah, because you, what was the speech you said? It was a variation of the thing that Norm, you probably heard me say to Chris Farley many times yeah. in writers' rooms, but just about how. You know, uh, that suggestion or idea was so uh, idiotic that everyone who heard it is now dumber. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> did you, were you, did you write the Chris Farley show? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. I mean, it was basically sort of inspired so heavily by Chris Farley. It's not like I said, do you think you could do this? You know, it was more, I have a, I want you to just do exactly what the kind of thing you're always doing. You know, 
but you knew Chris, you know, Norm, you knew him. He, he, uh, he would, he would do that kind of stuff. Um, uh, sit and just pump you for information about, about stuff where clearly he knew it in the subject better than you did. Who was the know? funniest guy ever on Saturday Night Live? Man, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I'd prefer to say that there's like a group of like 10 people who it's hard to find. Cause, you know, it, it's, it's. Is it Paula uh, Pell or? Uh, well, she's not a performer on the show, but, but. No, I, but I mean just in the room? No. Uh, oh, you it, mean the fun, Well, you know, I thought, I always thought that, uh, uh, Norm, you were one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Certainly, no, no, I'm I can't about, think of. Um, well, like Bill like, Murray, someone like David Spade is hilarious. He's me. unbelievably funny. But I meant, yeah, he's he's probably the funniest guy in in real life. But I'm saying but if you're, on, if you're, on on uh, as a sketch performer. As a sketch performer, I mean, the list would, and I don't know how to pick from among it, but it would have to include uh, Aykroyd, um, Bill Murray, uh, Eddie Murphy. Uh, Dana Carvey, uh, um, uh, well, geez, Will Ferrell. Uh, um, I think, I think, uh, so you a didn't lot like of, Belushi then? <laughs> well, I'm just, I don't know that I don't, I wouldn't put John at the first tier. That's all I'm saying. I'd put him like second team. Because just like a one, I know, one Because otherwise, this this first team is going to have way, way too many guys and they won't get playing time and they'll be unhappy. That's interesting. You didn't mention a woman. Oh, I thought you said the funniest guys. I was going to say the women next. I said the funniest performers. Okay, well, there at C, I hate women. You got <laughs> it out of me. <laughs> Still, um, I think that uh, uh, also it, it just well, I'd say That's the women point. we have now. I mean, I don't know how you'd have to how you'd pick between among I should say uh, Maya Rudolph and uh, Amy Poehler and Chris Wig. I mean, I think joining me now is nationally syndicated columnist and the author of. If Democrats had any brains, they'd be Republicans. <laughs> Ann Coulter. Hey, welcome to the show, Ann. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. I saw you on O'Reilly last night. You were magnificent. Uh, that's nice of you to say, but I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And I'm not used to, I'm not used to satellites. You must have done a lot of those. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you never get used to that. Yeah, I get all confused. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it's really fun to talk to you. Thank you. I'm a huge fan. Really? Yes. Wow. That's nice. <laughs> All right, Norman. <laughs> now, uh, Sorry, I hate when guests say that, but I am. Oh, that's nice. A pretty girl like you. What do you do for guys? I've always heard like <laughs> that. I've always heard that dudes are afraid of strong women. Do you ever? Have yeah. Any... Well, maybe weak men are, but that's not really what I'm in the market for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and let's start with this Iowa. They're all caucusing the Iowans. Yes. So, do well, you have any thoughts on that? I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Um, well, I don't know. I, I'm sort of torn on it because on one hand, I think it should be much, much, much more difficult to vote. Way too many people vote. Uh -huh. um, it's like having me vote on the Oscars and I never see movies um, to have most people voting. I don't understand this impulse. Oh, vote. It's your civic duty. Um, I think there ought to be a poll tax and a literacy test. But I'm not sure the Iowa caucus is the way to get at it, because you have to spend, it's not so bad for the Republicans, oddly enough, but for the Democrats, um, you have to go and attend a meeting all day. You have to sit in a meeting with, with annoying people. It's like jury duty for a day. Um, so and, and it's the people that just last the longest right. there, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why they haven't really done a bang-up job in the past. <laughs> now, who do you like on the Republican side? Um, well, I like Duncan Hunter the most, but of course he, he doesn't particularly have a chance. I guess yeah. other, other voters don't like cranky old men who don't smile much, as much as I do. <laughs> um, but on the issues, he's magnificent. Of our top candidates, and I guess there are four or five of them, the one I dislike the least is Mitt Romney. Uh-huh. But I'm not wild about any of them. Oh, well, I like them all better than any of the Democrats. Now, what I find intriguing about you is that you're um, unapologetically pro-life. and That's what I noticed about your appearance last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I emailed everyone on my email list. That was, that was magnificent. Well, it's not a popular opinion. But I've, I've always wondered why it's not a subject of debate in the country since the country is so split but you never hear it like discussed in rational terms like no, it's you're right you're right um 
Well, I think in part it's because one side doesn't really want the details discussed. Uh -huh. um, it's better to talk about it as a, a matter of, you know, women's, women's freedom and women's choice than sucking the brains out of a little baby. Um, yeah, why would they not just call it pro-abortion and anti-abortion? Yeah, it's not a good name. You know, they, <laughs> they've, these sociologists have noticed that, that names for ethnic groups um, are, um, you know, enrolling over the centuries when they're first called names, they're, they're epithets, and when the ethnic group, or whatever the group is, when it achieves, um, um, you know, status in society, uh, the, whatever the last ethnic group or um, name it was called is the one, nickname is the one that sticks, and then it's no longer considered a mean name. Um, and oh. it's the same thing with abortion. They keep changing the name. It's choice and women's rights and women's health care and a woman's right to choose. Um, but then people figure out what it is, and they hate whatever the new thing is. Yeah, what I've also found always a little suspect is when these ladies go like, I'm not for it, but <laughs> right. you know what I mean? Why aren't they for it? Right, right. Um, and we found out that they were, I mean, every once in a while, it's the corner of the act. Um, eye facts that always leap out at you um, and, and they slip every now and then because you're exactly right they're always saying well no one is for abortion no one is for abortion and then um, I don't know if you remember when, when Sam Alito was nominated to the Supreme Court you know the press descended on his sweet little Italian mother and started peppering her with questions and they asked her you know is your son um, uh, is he you know for or against abortion and she said well, of course he's against abortion. And that became a huge news item, <laughs> that Sam Alito was against abortion. But, you know, I thought they told us everybody was against abortion. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that your litmus test? Um, oh, I have lots of litmus tests. But, yeah, that's a big one. That's so you, a really, really big one. Because I know it's you're also, very serious about it. and I mean, do you view it as like a, a pogrom, like a, like a genocide? Like a what? Like a genocide? Like a? Uh, yes, uh -huh. yes, it's unbelievable what's going on. I mean, it's 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 amazing how restrained the pro-life forces are, but you, you know they won't they won't let us vote. I think we'd I think we'd win if I mean obviously the the Planned Parenthood side thinks that Americans are not copacetic with abortion because we're not allowed to vote on it. I mean that's part of what's so enraging about this. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh -huh. um, as long as the pre Supreme Court says that, that abortion is a constitutional right, there's nothing you can do. You can change as many hearts and minds as, as there are in the country, and there's nothing that can be done. You know, back in the 60s, um, these, these radicals used to, if they weren't going to sign up with, like, you know, the weathermen and blow up the Pentagon, they'd say, no, I'm going to work within the system, work within the system. Well, the pro-life forces have been working within the system for 40 years now, and, you know, patiently bide their time, try to get new Supreme Court justices, and then, you know, we end up with an O'Connor um, or a Kennedy who, who hallucinate the same right to abortion in the Constitution. Um, so, you know, I understand why, why violence breaks out. I wouldn't engage in violence myself. I wouldn't, I'm, I mean, just on the basis of Pascal's wager. But, but I can understand <laughs> if you're not going to let people vote that some of them are, are going to engage in violence. There hasn't been that much violence. I mean, it's about seven abortion doctors to, what, 40 million dead babies. It's a very tiny... I, I didn't understand the Pascal's wager. I mean, I know um, what that is. But. That was the argument for God. It's very, it's very simple. No, I know that. I know Pascal's wager, but I didn't understand what you meant. Oh, I wouldn't shoot an abortion doctor. Oh, because. Uh, yeah. What if I'm wrong? Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that, that's <laughs> interesting that you say, "What if I'm wrong?" <laughs> have you ever said that before? <laughs> I'm sure I have, though not on not on most of the idiotic things liberals say. <laughs> So you would not uh, support Giuliani then, or any other pro-choice candidate? No, I mean, if it's I've and I've been polling, um, you know, some of my friends on this. I mean, if it's, I think it would be very, I think it would be very bad for the country if both, if both the Republican and Democratic nominee um, support abortion. Um, so you know, I think that would be bad. But if they're both supporting abortion, yeah, I mean, I, I at first I was saying I'd never vote for a pro-abortion Republican, and then within about a week, I realized after a hard-fought fought campaign against Hillary Clinton, I'd probably go into the voting booth, pull the, the lever for whichever idiot we've nominated, including Giuliani, and then just lie to all my friends about it. 
Who, what, what is your sense of who, like, to me, it seems clear that Hillary Clinton will be the next president, but do you think so? I think so, too, and this, and this business about how she's losing in Iowa, I am very suspicious of, because, because of these sneaky little tricks of the Clinton machine, and one of the big ones they've always used is lowered expectations, um, the prime example of which was when, when Clinton was, was running in the Democratic primaries. You know, he came in like third or fourth in Iowa. He came in second in New Hampshire. And that one was when he was crowned the comeback kid. He came in second. <laughs> How are you the comeback kid? Well, it's because they had spent, you know, weeks lowering expectations. And, oh, he's washed up. He's finished. He's over. And the funniest example was right before they released his, his grand jury testimony. This is the one in, in which he... He uh, launched the one about it depends on what the meaning of is is, and we got into a lot of discussions of, you know, where his penis was in relation to Monica Lewinsky, and it was so embarrassing. I mean, the, the grand jury, the, the, the black grand jury in Washington, D.C., that was sympathetic to Bill Clinton, they laughed out loud as he was giving his testimony. And so before it was released to the public and played all over TV, the rumors went out, you'll probably remember this, that, that Clinton turned purple and there was spittle coming out of his mouth and he stormed out of the room. Well, okay, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> it was embarrassing. <laughs> what is the definition of the word is? Do we have an OED <laughs> I thought it was pretty simple. Yeah, it is. It's almost a word that's so <laughs> simple you don't even know the definition. <laughs> this is why I so wish, I don't think it will happen, but I so wish Obama would be their nominee. I think he would be tougher to beat than Hillary, and I don't care. I just want to be rid of this national pestilence of the Clintons. <laughs> <laughs> the national pestilence. pestilence. <laughs> Our long national pestilence is over. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Barack's got money. Yes. Yes, I mean, that does give you, that is a, a heartening fact about the Democrats, that even they feel a little creepy about the Clintons. It's funny, you know, Barack always ends his thing was, let's go change the world. And isn't that what uh, Bush is doing? <laughs> yeah, in a pretty transformative and important way. <laughs> hey, Ann, you're going to stay with us for one more segment, right? Wait, what? The Dennis Miller Show. <coughs> Breakers. Fifteen seconds, guidance internal, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start, engines on, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, all engines running, launch commit, we have The Dennis Miller Show, 866-509-7268. Ann Coulter is kind enough to uh, stay with us for a second segment. Uh, Ann, I wanted to talk to you um, about Christianity, because you're Christian, right? Yes, I am. And I, I like it because um, it seems to me that you're an actual Christian. And I, I know you got, Sal was telling me uh, he was against the uh, thing you did on Donnie Deutsch, but... Not according to liberals. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter but is I that I don't think they're really down with 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 the scripture since they're often standing up at college lectures demanding to know how I could be a Christian if I smoke and wear short skirts. And I keep <laughs> looking for those passages of the Bible. <laughs> but it's very strange, like because I always hear, you know, that people don't like Christians because, uh, you know, they they uh, believe it's the only true faith and they want to convert people, but that's the, the basis of Christianity, isn't it? Right, and I would assume, you know, any religion, including the godless religion of liberalism, you know, they want us all to be liberals. They want us to change our light bulbs to those, to those goofy, you know, <laughs> global warming protecting light bulbs. Um, you know, I assume <laughs> now wants to convert us all to want to suck the brains out of little babies and so on and so forth. I mean, Wait, isn't that... that that's now illegal, though, right? Partial birth abortion? Um, yes. It took a long time, but yes, it is. And that, what I don't understand is, like, I remember in the Scott Peterson case, he was charged with right. double homicide. So right. wouldn't that mean that the, the baby was a... <laughs> yes, that's a big issue, actually. These pro-abortion groups are against those laws. Um, 
And by the way, Hillary Clinton denounced the Supreme Court decision uh, upholding the federal law banning partial birth abortion. Uh, did all the uh, Democrats? Um, I think, yeah, I think every single one of the candidates did. Everyone who had a comment on it, um, I'd have to look it up. I wrote about her. I'm sure I noticed it at the time. I know Hillary did. It and seems... one of the ones did who, who voted in favor of the law. Really? Who would that have been? Maybe Biden. I don't know. But, um, you know, these, these Democrats want to get their votes on the record um, as having voting in favor of a ban on partial birth abortion, but then turn around and denounce the Supreme Court decision upholding the law they voted for. But surely, I don't know, I, I should have asked John Zogby, but surely... Uh... Oh. So uh, now we got a guest, which is cool, Jack Duval. He's David Duval's brother. Do you know the yeah. golfer? Is that true? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> but that would be cool, right? Yeah. He almost won the U.S. Open. He's the president of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. That's cool. What's that mean? It means uh, people power. Yeah. When people rise up, demand their rights. Well, is that what they did with, in that movie Gandhi? Which was, yeah. by the way, based on a true story I heard? In fact, it happened, yeah. Yeah. But don't a lot of people die doing that? Well, that's because the uh, the British uh, began to shoot Indians. Yeah, right. Well, that won't that happen if you if you do your if your part is nonviolent. <laughs> ah, but that's where it gets interesting. If yeah. you've got a great strategy and you know how to diffuse repression, there are ways of doing that tactically. Then, uh, then it doesn't work. It doesn't work one on one, right? Uh, like let's say me, let's say a guy comes at me with a gun. Me being nonviolent, that would not work ever. No, I mean you know I'm right. not a pacifist. I think everybody yeah. has the right to self-defense. If yeah. uh, it's the only thing you can do to defend yourself and your family, absolutely. But you need a lot of people. So this could happen in Iran, right? You don't necessarily need lots and lots of people because here's the deal: um, if um, if I were in a room with like um, maybe 25 or 50 people. Yeah. And I was threatening them with a gun, and I said, okay, uh, I want you to do the following things, otherwise right. I'm going to shoot you. Right. They'd have a choice. They could say, okay, we'll do those things. We don't want you to shoot us. Or if I were convinced that none of them were going to do the things that I wanted them to do, even if I were threatening them with a gun, then the threat of violence wouldn't have any power because it's always a transaction. Whoever's right, but what about the uh, just the fun of shooting someone? Like a lot of these people are sadists. That's another story. Yes, absolutely, and that's what these movements do. Like in Iran, they can, if their tactics are strategic, what they can do is to essentially separate that element from within the military and the police forces, which are interested, like the besiege in Iran, uh, and enjoy beating people up uh, from regular army people who see themselves as defenders of the public order and the nation's honor and all the rest of that stuff. Hey, can you tell me about Iran? Because I don't understand anything about it because I don't know anything except what I see on TV. Well, we had a really interesting and, and uh, not unique set of circumstances in which uh, the Iranian regime basically stole an election. And Iran no, no, but I mean beforehand. Like, Remember, uh, remember uh, when the students uh, took over the embassy and all that with the hostages? That's another story. That was a violent revolt that was that was actually a stunt that was pulled by an extreme faction of the Islamic Revolution. So they were to, they were young students, right? They weren't intelligent, like educated? No, that was inspired. That was Why like, are there why are there educated students in Iran? Why would that old guy let that happen? <laughs> well, the old guy, you see, that was already after the Islamic Revolution had succeeded. So the power that sat there was the new leaders of the Islamic Revolution. Right. And, uh, and so that was designed, in fact, to help. In, it, was in, it was for internal domestic politics to enable more power to accrue to the extreme part of the regime. And essentially, that's the same thing that we saw earlier this month in Tehran. But did they have, like, uh, did they have satellites during uh, the first, that Khomeini guy? No, they didn't, but you know, Khomeini used the technology of the day to get in power, which was audio tapes. They mass-produced audio tapes of his speeches. He was a very charismatic speaker, and hundreds of thousands of those were, were infiltrated throughout Iran, and, and many believe that, uh, you know, he was the liberator uh, from the Shah. But what I'm asking is, like, those guys, those ayatollahs, because they're so serious about the, what they believe and stuff, why would they um, allow uh, any Western 
communication to enter the country? Why wouldn't they just be a Hey, it's the way country? you do business these days. They don't have a choice. If they don't allow digital media in, they can't function in the real world. They, uh, they can't make a profit as a regime. So it's, uh, uh, it is a trade-off for them. And uh, the, those who felt that this election had been stolen and poured into the streets used that same digital media, uh, which was then cranked down by the regime in order to s help snuff out the protests, and that phase was successful, but they have to go back to allowing full use uh, because otherwise, they, as I said, they can't function in the world economy. The new uh, the new guy, Cam Amy, which sounds suspiciously like Home Amy to <laughs> yeah. me. Plus, he has a long white beard that looks exactly alike. But wasn't uh, the first guy like uh, like real famous, and then this guy was kind of hid in the background and pretended that other guy was powerful? The yes, yes, Norm, exactly. The uh, uh, in fact, there was this guy was a controversial pick uh, 20 years ago to be the supreme leader because he wasn't a famous uh, cleric. Uh, he wasn't regarded as uh, spiritually advanced, and it was kind of a political power play that put him into the seat. Huh? Can they, what are those guys have? What are, what are those guys' powers? Those clerics, those mullahs? Can they talk to God and stuff? <laughs> they certainly think they do, and uh, uh, but you know, it's a it's a. It's hey, I'm not going to argue with them. <laughs> no, not on that. That's for sure. We can argue with them about the way they're governing their country, yeah. depriving people of their rights. But, but their uh, beliefs I strongly agree with. Pardon me? My, their beliefs I strongly agree with. I just want them all to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Something there's no point being controversial about. I found that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's... Um, um, I mean, anything that is uh, supremely serious, as the supreme leader and his machinations uh, are, uh, we have to find some basis to, to laugh a little bit about it. And uh, but when that guy stood, when us. that guy stood in front of the uh, tank in Tiananmen Square, was he an important person, or was he uh, symbolically, uh, but not, but not strategically? He did something, though. Something changed within China since he did that. You know, I mean, I, I don't think so at the time, but I think that what that, um, that taught that regime to invent better ways of keeping control, keeping the lid on. Uh, and it also taught the regime that there needed to be a loosening in some direction for uh, the new generations. And so the economic loosening and uh, the turn to free market um, policies did help to accommodate the rising energies of the next generation. But the Chinese made a strong point that one guy standing there, man, that ain't nothing if you got a tank. But we got to go, and then we'll talk to you in a little bit, right, Christian? Uh, Jack, if you have the time, we'd uh, like to hold you through the break, is what you Norm is saying. Okay, thanks. I have no idea. I, you notice I can't add in one thing. Why? All I'm doing is sitting here thinking, what would Dennis ask? What would Dennis's <laughs> point be what would his view be what well, would his I, position be oh yeah yeah i forgot to do that right now yeah see they couldn't hear what i was saying i was trying to be oh. off the air oh. so uh that's norm mcdonald and this is the dennis miller show give us a call at 866-99 dennis that's 866-99 dennis we're joined now by jack duval who is president of the international scene Center on uh, nonviolent mm -hmm. conflict. Welcome mm -hmm. to the show. Hey, so uh, he's back. So nonviolence. So tell us about that because that's a pretty fascinating uh, thing. Well, you know, when it's used by people that get into the streets, as in Iran, it works if three things happen: if uh, people mobilize in large numbers in ways that really Im impress uh, the rest of the country as representing everyone's grievances. In other words, if there's unity. Right to uh, take this action. Secondly, if they put real pressure on the institutions of the state and drive up the cost of repression, and finally... If what is the cost of repression now? The co Well, I mean, it's the cost of... You can't put a number state. on it. Uh, consider this. No. If you have a million people in the streets for 20 days, which is effectively what the Ukrainians did in the uh, so-called Orange Revolution uh, five years ago, if you do that, then everybody's working overtime, the cost of doing that to the state goes up, all these uh, these authoritarian regimes are incompetently managed. That pressure 
is extreme. And then people within the security forces begin to say, hey, wait a minute, this is not what I signed up for. Is this sustainable? Who's going to win this thing? And then they begin to think, mm, maybe I shouldn't, you know, if, I, if I'm, you know, beating somebody up, maybe that means that they'll know who I, that I did that when the new group takes power. If, and you if see the that new over group and over that takes power, If the new group that takes power, so the nonviolent conflict is a, a political... It's one, about power. One, yes, one person, about power. One person's idea, so... Uh, that person would be whoever. Ayatollah Khomeini would have been that person. Well, that person is going to be somebody who the people perceive as representing their grievances, because right. that's so, the only way you can mobilize them. In, the in Iran, it wouldn't be this other character, would it? Well, the thing about Mousavi was that he was a safe choice, because he was within the... He, he um, said he abided by it, would abide by the Islamic State. Yeah. He was a moderate, he was reformist, so a lot of people who wanted sort of a soft change could identify with him. But Is there anybody in Iran now It's like Yeltsin, just a crazy drunk that'll get up and say anything and the people will get behind him? Ahmadinejad is a dogmatist, you know? He, yeah. he, he's, uh, uh, and he's not a classic authority. This is a, this is a clique. There's yeah. been a coup. And the extreme form of the Shiite Islamists in Iran have essentially taken complete control of the state. That's the fundamental political reality of what's occurred. Yeah. And that is scary. But is it scary if you do nonviolent confrontation then a guy what if a guy beheads you? <laughs> do you at some point like struggle back? Hey, sometimes that can work for you because the more outrageous the repression, the more angry people become and then there's a fire next time. Right. So you got to be able to put your life uh, on it's almost like uh, suicide bombings except it's actual suicide not homicide. In a, in a sense, certainly political suicide. If a regime is too violent, then it it really ends up, you know, uh, busting its bank. Because like, remember uh, that old dude in the newspaper that set himself on fire? He you mean a, back in the Vietnam War days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I certainly do. Would it? that guy be the king of all nonviolent protesters that he had reached this point where he could? No, because not everybody will will do that, and and generally the most effective nonviolent <laughs> action is one that inspires I uh, imitation very few and people. The other people want to do the same thing. It, did you say immolation? Imitation. Oh, imitation. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said that, that immolation was our. Do but uh, uh, Todd has a question. Well, now for I'm you. wondering if it's a stupid question. It is a stupid question. It's yours. Well, you, <laughs> <laughs> you said off the air it was okay, and so did the producer. Um, no, if like, what about the 9/11 situation? Like when they were up in the air, there's nothing nonviolent you can do there to stop that, right? That uh, that's right. Another uh, situation of uh, what I would call... Uh, because there's not mass people. One of the three things you need. Well, there's 300. <laughs> that, that's not mass, right? Versus, versus Jack, am I right? You could, well, you know, in a technical sense, I mean, you, you, the power of the people in the airplane could overwhelm a small armed... And by the way, just let me interject you, real quickly. I'm not uh, implying that they should have done anything. Right. I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. So asking that I'm question... I'm saying it's a shame... That uh, that du David Duval only lost by one stroke, <laughs> and I think Jack's still feeling it. Actually, usually I'm. Uh, I, everybody asks me, "Well, do you know Robert Duval?" Oh, Robert Duval, yeah. He's the guy. Actually, he had a brother whose name was Jack too, and that guy I did know. Oh, really? So you knew uh, Robert Duval's brother, Jack Duval, because you go to a convention of guys named Jack Duval. <laughs> <laughs> I actually once Googled myself and for watch your mouth, and I found out there were 44 Jack Duvalls in the United States. So uh, yeah, it's humbling. It, it, yeah, definitely. You know? yeah. How many Norm Macdonald? Well, you know when you YouTube and you go like, "Hey man, I listen to a James Brown song," and instead it's a guy in his basement doing James Brown. <laughs> right. You're like, well, I didn't want this. <laughs> Why is that number one? Although those right. music videos are great, sometimes there's an unknown, and it's amazing what they what they're capable of. Hey, Robert show. Duvall is an unknown in uh, our next guest, Billy Joe Shaver's uh, a video. You know Billy Joe? I remember Billy Joe. Yeah, well, he does. Uh, he does. Uh, What's the uh, matter he, with the clothes I'm wearing? Is what? Billy Joel, sure. No, that's Billy Joel. Billy Joel Shaver. Acting stupid. So anyways, he was up for Gospel Album of the Year, and he has Robert Duvall as a uh, a walk-on. But Jack, thanks, man. You, you, you taught me a lot about Iran, and I bet a lot of dumb people in the, in the audience that are as dumb as I am learned a lot of stuff, too. You can't be afraid to ask, because other people are thinking the same thing. Oh, it was a pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. You're a smart you betcha, guy. Jack. Hey, listen, uh, is Jack still there? No, well, he cut him off. I had one question for him. What? Well, I'll answer it. I was going to say, what is the guy We're like wrapping it up. We're wrapping it up. We'll be back on Here. the Dennis Miller Show.
Joining us now, Robert Duvall, whose new movie, Seven Days in Utopia, is now in theaters. Mr. Duvall, welcome. Oh, yes, sir. How you doing? I'm doing all right, baby. Yeah, I uh, I was telling uh, Kevin earlier, this is how I go to movies. I go, people go, you want to go to a movie? I go, is Robert Duvall in it? They go, yes, <laughs> I go. Well, all right, Dave. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. If that's what you really mean, that's fine. I really mean it. And right, I consider good. you the Appreciate greatest it. actor in the world. Well, thank you very much. Sir. And I wonder, because I always think if somebody is the best, they know it at some level. And also, I know that you're a man of faith and false modesty is a sin. And I was wondering, <laughs> do you consider yourself the greatest actor in the world? I think I can hold my own with a lot of people. So I, I don't know if there's one person that's the greatest. Some some people say Daniel Day Lewis is the best. He's improved. I didn't used to like him. I like him a lot now. But there, you know, there's 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 a group that are very good. So I don't know if anybody's the best. Well, here's what I here's how I am with acting. I have a lot of problems with acting because I have trouble suspending my disbelief. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. so a lot of times when I'm watching an actor, I can see him acting. Like I'm going, oh, that guy's acting. Right. Uh, I don't see that with you. Never. Well, you try You try to keep it invisible. You try to take it back to just the, the basic premise of uh, I talk, you listen, you listen, I talk. To keep it that simple between the words action and cut. You know, if you're doing film, you know. So uh, you try to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah, a absolutely. Now, an actor... Well, let's say a guy is always himself, you know what I mean? Like a guy like John Wayne or something like that. He could be very good. Him, I believe, because there's no good. disconnect between what I see when he's interviewed and what I see. But yeah. you, on the other hand, uh, are, are different in every role. Well, you still got to bring yourself underneath. There's only one you, right? Right, that's true, yeah. So you can't, you can't really become something that you're not. It, 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 you create create the, the illusion of something else, but it's you underneath. You got one set of emotions, one psyche, one everything. So you have to know how to use yourself to 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 bend it or whatever to make it seem like it's something else. Now I've noticed in your body of work, obviously talking to you, you're an incredibly literate person and a, a very thinking person. And I met you one time. This is I'll tell you this. I met you one time at Saturday Night Live. Garth oh, yeah. Brooks was the host, and you came in. Oh, yeah, right, right. And I was very excited because you were going to do a, I don't know if you remember this, you were going to do a song. Yeah. And, and you didn't do it, and I was very sad about that. But I was so, uh, uh, I wanted to meet you so bad, and then I met you, and I talked to you, and I had all these questions for you. And then you started talking to me and asking me questions, and you were very looking at me very deeply and asking me because I come from a, a rural uh, a farm area in Canada. And you were asking me about ranchers and stuff like that. And uh, I was, I don't know if you did that to deflect uh, my questions or if you do that to study people and steal their soul. I don't know. I don't know. What part, where are you from? Uh, from uh, what part of Canada? So you're doing it right now. I'm from uh, uh, I'm from rural uh, uh, Alberta, where it's. Oh, I love Alberta. That's my, that's my the only part of Canada I really like. Oh, really? Is uh, I love Alberta. The ranch people up there, the Buse family. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, it's good people up there. Great people, yeah. And that's and that brings me to you. You often uh, portray the common man. Is that something that I, you're not Southern, but you've played a lot of Southern characters? Well, my my dad's from Virginia. And that's the beginning of the South, so I feel comfortable. You know, I like the Southeast Conference Football League, and uh, mm -hmm. I feel okay in the South. Even though, you know, I'm in Texas too. My some of my mother's people are from Texas, which is below the Mason Dixon line, so to speak. You know. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like to portray the common man, except, uh, you know, when I played, uh, one of my favorite parts was when I played Joseph, Joseph Stalin. He wasn't so com He was common, but not so common, you know. So you, you don't mind playing a guy that, uh, that you have to figure out the good part of him or something? No, no. He's, 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 each, each part's a challenge, so, you know, you, you, uh, you, know, you go with, with what you have to do, you know, research or whatever, you know, and just jump in and do it, you know. 
Now, yeah. Kevin Farley has a question for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been like, uh, you know, you've done some big movies with big actors. Was it ever hard? Like, did you get nervous? And how do you deal with your nerves? You know, when you're when you're when you have to really bring your game, your A game, and and that could like say the Godfather with the you know scenes with Brando or yeah. anything like that. Did you were you ever really nervous? Where you had trouble like controlling your nerves? Where you're like, oh gosh. Yeah. Well, the last the last job I did it was the most nervous I've ever got in my career. I worked with Billy Bob Thornton. I call him the Hillbilly Orson Welles. The guy's brilliant, and we did an interesting movie and. Uh, and the night before, I had to do a scene, and it, it worked. But I was so frightened. I had to do a guy that his his grandson slips LSD in his iced tea. Wow. <laughs> and I had to, like, unbeknownst, I had to. So I did, I think that, that intense fear helped pro- propel me into the scene and make it work in a strange way. Yeah. Because it. Uh, it was a very demanding scene, but it worked. It worked, and Billy Billy doesn't care if you change things, change. Some of these directors you can't change er to out of air. Yeah. But a guy like Billy, he, he he leaves it open, even though the writing is brilliant, what he's done. He lets you uh, he lets you come up with stuff at the moment, which is very, uh, very uh, admirable, I think. Yeah. It is interesting that you bring up Billy Bob Thornton, because I agree with you. I, when I saw um, uh, Sling Blade, yeah. I was like, this guy... Is exactly what you said. I said this guy's Orson Welles. How did oh, he do absolutely. this? He's up there with Coppola or Altman or any of them. For yeah. Me. yeah. But then he stopped. Well, he stopped and, and, and he has a country band. He goes around. So I right. I sent a message to him. Do you sing as good as Lefty Brazell, knowing the answer? You know. <laughs> I, guess, I guess he sings. Okay. You know. I don't know. But you know, he's he's got to get back to his A game because uh, the guy uh, he wrote. Direct and acted, and he's uh, he, that he's on a high level in in, uh, in all those aspects. Well, can I ask you a question? Because you were in the Sling Blade, you played his dad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was I don't this, this may be a I don't know if you want to answer this question or not, but you're an honest guy, right? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> you go on Sling Blade. Yeah. You're watching that. Does that character he did in Sling Blade remind you of a character you may have done uh, 30 years ago? Well, yeah, that's what Horton Foote thought, maybe. You know, you're talking about tomorrow? Yes, sir. Well, yeah. that's what Horton Foote thought maybe he was doing me, but I don't think so. I don't know if he ever even saw that. Mm-hmm. But uh, not not really, maybe a little bit. They could have been cousins, so to speak, you know, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, when I did it with Billy Bob, we there was no script. We just He just rolled the camera and we improvised. Is that, that right? It. Wow. So, uh, you know, he's, he's great to work with, and oh, uh, yeah. he's got some more things he's going to do, you know, and he's got a, he's, got, he's, he's great. He's you a, have an incredible taste in the choices you make, right? You, you yeah. must put thought into this. Do what now? Are you, you're a, are you a literary uh, person? Well, somewhat. You know, I, I read, you know, what I want to read, you know. I, you know, I, I mean... I'm reading a lot of stuff on the on the, on the Comanche Indians now because a friend of mine may direct Empire of the Summer Moon, that terrific script. On oh yeah, yeah. I'm you know I, I guess you know I, I I may be wrong, but everybody Horton Foote once said people don't know what goes on beyond the South Jersey Shore from New York necessarily, right. and uh, I think that uh, I don't know what I saw of the Searchers. There's it may be a great movie by John Ford, but what I saw I got to watch the whole thing. I found some of it corny. Yeah. Melodramatic. You found some, some of the searchers corny? Yes, absolutely. Which parts? Yeah. Absolutely. Please come home. Please come back. You know, you know. And this, this, this book deals with the real thing of, of that woman that was ca- captured by, a, 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 you know, by the, by the Comanches. Sure. And, uh, but, it, I mean, if you, if you criticize, a friend of mine once said, if you criticize John Ford, and you know, like I got this great icon from Hollywood. It's like attacking motherhood. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. But uh, but there's some some of those old guys. Like when I did True Grit, that was one of the worst directors I ever worked with in my life. Henry Hathaway. Yeah, one of, really? one of the worst. Some of those old guys were like tyrants, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The right. opposite of Billy Bob. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, I remember you saying one time that that I found interesting that you either like the new kind of acting or the old kind of acting, and you don't like the old kind of acting. Well, some no. A guy like a guy like Spencer Tracy, for the most part, was terrific. Of course, when he did Old Man in the Sea, the Communist Daily newspaper in Havana, Cuba, blasted him, saying that you know here's a here's a Anglo-Saxon trying to play a Cuban. But but you know, <laughs> actually, you know, when he was right, like Bad Dad, Black Rock, he was wonderful. But I think that the the young actors today are better than ever. You do. 
Yeah. Absolutely. You go in each country. Look at the look at the look at the African Americans, the black actors we have now. They never could act before. Before it was like uh, Uncle Tom time. Yeah. You know, wonderful black actors, Spanish actors, guys in Argentina. I know wonderful actors, Spain, England. Mm-hmm. You know, it's open to all now. It's, it's an in medium that's open to all. So yeah. I think you know. I mean, there's good and bad still, but there's. I think overall, the young actors, the bar's been raised. Maybe those who went before, we helped them find that uh, yeah. that aspect of it all. But uh, no, I, I really think the, that it's open for all, and there's still bad work, obviously, and bad movies. But uh, the, the, some of the young actors are wonderful. Well, tell us about yeah. this young actor that you're working with in uh, Seven Days. In, he's, in he's, out, he's as good as they get. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, he's, he's terrific, uh, Lucas Black. He's a he's a scratch golfer. Wow. It's the only movie ever that where. Uh, you know where the, the the lead actor can hit the ball, really. Yeah, and he's a, and he's <laughs> no, that's true. Guy. In between takes, he, he said, "I will." He said, "I will challenge the world champion turkey caller and beat him." He does these phenomenal <laughs> animal calls because he grew up with nature, fishing in in the backwoods of Alabama. You know, oh, but wow. he's, a, he's a terrific kid. And uh, we when we did uh, the movie, it was uh, it was wonderful to go work in Texas with the with uh, just great people down in that hill country and uh the, the lou waters and his family and uh ken herford uh, and, the, and the the golf pro stand there all these wonderful people welcomed us and it was it was great working with with that's the reason I, one of the reasons i took it to work with lucas yeah yeah well i'm gonna love it because i love god i don't i don't think you love golf but i love golf well, I like it okay. It just takes too much time. Yeah, it's a yeah, lot of time. <laughs> my, good friend Jimmy Con- my good friend Jimmy Conn's always out playing, but I'm I'm afraid to ask, ask him his handicap because I know he'll, like, exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of golfers lie. Yeah. I, I read a thing once in Golf Digest that went out because it's very, um, uh, you know, a lot of integrity of real golfers, you know. And it was, yeah, well, I, I've heard of guys picking up the ball when you're not looking and throwing it another 100 feet. Or, yeah, yeah. Or, 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 you know, on the, on the score card, I guess it's easier to cheat consciously and unconsciously, you know. <laughs> sure, sure. You know, my second favorite golfer beside behind Tiger is in your movie, K.J. Choi. Oh, he's terrific, yeah. Was, yeah he a I, cool, was he a cool guy? Yeah, I didn't get to know him, but they say he is. Yeah, he's, you know, he played a villain, but uh, he's supposed to be a really a terrific and really a nice guy, you know, so... So uh, yeah, it was it was interesting working with those guys. You know, it was I love working in Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, man, we should talk about Lonesome Dove because that's the uh, my favorite part. Uh, that that's yeah. your favorite part ever. Yeah, ever. Real, yeah. not Tender Mercies. No, ever. No, I should let the uh, English play Hamlet and King Lear. I'll play Augustus McRae. <laughs> you know what's interesting? I just thought of this, but you in many like we were talking about tomorrow. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 Boo Radley, obviously, you played. Horton, Horton Foot, the great writer. Yeah, my friend. It was wonderful, man. And ma- so many of these parts that you played uh, uh, were very, uh, is the word taciturn? People that don't speak very, is that oh, a word? Yes. I don't, I don't know if that's a word. But you, uh, you don't speak a lot. And in Tomorrow, you virtually don't speak at all. Well, I, when I did, I, I, I saw a guy in southern Missouri who wants to talk like a cow. So that's the way I kind of did it. We did it as a, a stage play first for 25 performances at Herbert Burghoff's studio in New, New York City, and then we did the movie afterwards, you know. Yeah. So it was like a oh. complete experience. But it just occurred mm-hmm. to me, since you, all, since, you play these, since you played these characters before Lonesome Dove that were, were very um, non-verbose, that maybe Call would be the guy that you would play. Well, that's what McMurtry still says that... I should have played Call. He's, he, he's, he wrote it. He's, he's absolutely out to lunch on that. Ab- yeah. You mean That's after God, the my, movie? My, my, my ex-wife said to me, I read a novel I like better than Dostoevsky. Don't let them talk to you into playing Call. You've got to play this other guy. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah so, so I, I really... So even after, the, even after the miniseries, McMurtry thought you were miscast. Yeah, well, that you know, shows you where his head is. <laughs> <laughs> well, can we come back? Can you stay for another thing? Because I wanted to talk about faith with you. Yeah, okay, yeah. We'll talk about a little faith. Come on, let's do that. <laughs> That'd be okay. cool, baby. All right. All right, we'll be back with the greatest actor in the world by my uh, standard and by his own, self-admitted. <laughs> 
I, I wanted to talk about country music because I love country music, and I know Robert Duvall. Oh yeah, loves I like it. Music. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we actually have a common friend, Billy Joe Shaver, who I love. Oh, Billy Joe, you know, my wife made a wonderful documentary on him. I saw it. It oh, was yeah. awesome. Oh, he, he was so natural in front of the camera. When I put him in the, uh, the Apostle way back the second day, he said he came out and said, "Hell, I got this deal licked." He said. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, if there's a guy whose life story should be made into a movie, isn't it that guy? I think so. Chris Trofferson once said, if life was a television show, Billy Joe Shavers come on, come on, come on every morning at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you this, Mr. Duvall, um, yeah. uh, cause I want to, uh, since we were talking about country music and Billy Joe Shaver and stuff, uh, when I talk to Billy Joe Shaver, this is what, um, I love about country music and I talk to him about writing a lot. Right. And, uh, he says that, um, the hardest thing about it is taking very big ideas and putting them in very small uh, uh, writing, you know, very pithy writing, you know, right. not to be over. And and I, it strikes me that your acting is like that, like a, a, lo a lot of the things that you do, like in Tender Mercies, uh, Tender Mercies, which I loved, uh, you don't speak a lot. Right, right. Yeah. So now what's the question? The question is... Uh, is that why you love country music? No, I just like country music because I've always listened to it. My brothers sang opera and sang, uh, they were classically trained, and I always just loved uh, country music. That was, yes, you know, I, I, I loved it. Now, I suppose you'd say that's corny, too. You seem to say everything's corny. Well, no, no. There's there's a legitimate sense of melodrama. I mean, you, you find that in Shakespeare. For, you know, I mean, melodrama can be very valid, you know, the things that seem melodramatic, you know. Right, right. Because, like, a lot, like, I'm always defending country music because people say to me, like, oh, country music, it's just about, you You know, your dog dying, you're losing your truck, and you're... Right, right. Play it all backwards. Yeah, yeah but, but I go, that's <laughs> life. That's what life is. Yeah, but the, the point is, you go, I, I took my wife to her first opera here in Washington, D.C., where they played subtitles. They put the subtitles up there, what they were singing in Italian. It was far cornier and simplistic than any country song I ever I ever heard. <laughs> so your so you're, uh, uh, country musicians you like, Lefty Frizzell, you said? Yeah, well, I love Merle Haggard, but there's so many I like. Mm. I like Bobby Bear. I like... Uh, I loved Waylon Jennings and Johnny Cash. They oh, yeah. died too young, these guys. Yeah. Well, Waylon oh. Jennings, yeah, he was the greatest. Oh, uh, and, and it's interesting and you Tammy mentioned. Tammy Wynette was wonderful. She, oh, oh, she was a wonderful lady. She, yeah, you oh, like yeah. lady singers? Talking about it. Yeah. What about. It's interesting you bring up Merle Haggard because I might be way off base, but when I saw Tender Mercies, I'm like, oh, he's doing Merle. Well, Isn't that's what somebody thought. That's what. The, uh, Willie Nelson asked me if I was aping Merle Haggard. I said, "Well, I love him. I don't know if I was aping him or not, but maybe, you know. I, you know, I, you know. It, uh, so, and then George Jones said it was his life story, which it wasn't. You know? <laughs> so, I don't know. It's, uh, oh, but you know, speaking, speaking of faith based, uh, real quick, Billy Joe Shavers. You know, he uh, he lost his his son, his his mother, and his wife, who he married three times. He lost them. They died all in in one year. It was incredible. It was like a like 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 Job. Yeah, I said, Billy Joe, how'd you get through this? He pointed to his chest and said, "Jesus Christ." Now you can't yeah. say that in New York City. Up yeah. north, you don't do that. But down there in the south, of those guys, that you know, they're 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 pretty inundated in in the in the philosophy and belief beliefs of Jesus Christ. You know, so that's what he he said to me at one point, Billy yeah. Joe. Yeah, they're not uh, they're not afraid to, uh, to say it. And and you're right. If people if you say it in like I live in Los Angeles, if you yeah. say such a thing, people will look at you like you're saying you have Down syndrome or something. Yeah. Well, who's the writer from Alabama? Also, he wrote a book it's all over about the shouting. I forget his name. He wrote for the New York uh, one of the New York papers. I forget the guy's name right now. He brought that up out in the South. You do that, but then once you get above the Mason Dixon line, sometimes it's difficult to bring up Jesus or anybody like that because it, they look at you like you're a square or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, they look at you like it's they they reduced him to a silly character. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I'm sure that was uh, that must have been your um, your motive in uh, writing and directing and starring in the Apostle. Do I? Yeah, it took me many years to get it off the ground. I did. I had to use my own money and everything. Had I done it in Hollywood, they would have never never done it correctly. They would have play, paid me big time patronize the subject, patronize certain regions in, Amer in America. When I did it, I put up my own money. I got I got my money back plus changed, and that was it. But I, I got 
great satisfaction in doing it. Yeah, yeah. Because because I got b- from both ends. I heard that Bill, uh, I heard that uh, you know that uh, uh, the great preacher you know from uh, 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 Billy Graham liked it. And then I got a wonderful letter from Marlon Brando saying he liked it. So I got it from <laughs> the secular great. and the religious. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. great. That's both fantastic. <laughs> you got it from both Because sides. you, uh, what was the name of the character? Uh, 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 Sonny. Sonny. Uh, 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 Sonny, too. I, I wanted to use my mother's maiden name, but th- that was the name of some preacher, so I didn't want to get a lawsuit. So, uh, his, <laughs> Sonny Dewey, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah exactly, yeah. But that movie yeah. really struck me, because I, I grew up in a rural uh, 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 Canada in a very very small town, and the preachers would come, and we would go and listen to them. Yeah, now, they're, they're, they're some of those preachers up there in Canada. I actually went to some. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. They're a little, they're a little different from the guys. In the, I'm on the devil's hit list. <laughs> <laughs> well, we never had the Southern Baptists, but we would have the the famous people from the United States come, and you yeah. could tell. I, I could at a young age. Who were the real guy? Now uh, I didn't. I don't know. I can't look into a man's heart. But some of them seemed fake. Like for instance, I saw Jim Baker. He seemed like a like a complete fake. Well, he could be. Yeah, a lot of those guys. Yeah. yeah. That, but I absolutely. tell you, I, I saw Jimmy Swaggart, and I thought that's a real guy. And even when he did his uh, his apology on TV. That seemed authentic to me. Yeah, but he he does like to he he's minimized his crocodile tears since then. <laughs> you know, he, he's very talented. You think is those he, were crocodile uh, tears? Yeah, yeah. Billy, uh, his uh, his uh, cousin, who was the, who's his cousin? He's, Jerry uh, Lee Lewis. Yeah, he said we walk we work different sides of the street. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> really? So but you think? But you know, the country singer, what's his name? The guy from Nova Scotia, uh, uh, Hank Snow. Hank Snow. Uh, well, well, his his son was a Pentecostal preacher. He was one of the first guys I saw doing my research. Uh, Jimmy Star, he's a has a church down there. But what happened was, uh, Lefty Frizzell's uh, wife went to his church, so he's he knew Je- Lefty was a rounder and he was a drank and this and that. He says God told me to tell you to to leave Lefty. And Lefty called him up and said, well, God told me to tell you I'm going to come over there and whip your ass. <laughs> <laughs> you were ra- what were you raised? What were you raised? <laughs> anyway. What were you raised, Robert? Oh, I was just a Protestant family. Uh, oh, okay. Family. Yeah, yeah, my dad was uh, different, yeah. Uh, Kevin, you're, you're a Catholic. Irish Catholic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So right. I was raised Protestant. That's a little more, Catholic's a little more ritual. A lot of ritual. Protestants a little more. I don't know if it's a little more visceral, direct. Maybe. Yeah, don't get my wife started. She comes out of a <laughs> Catholic family in uh, Argentina where the where the Jesuits ruled. But yeah, you know, yeah, we I won't get ready. into that. We no. won't get into that. <laughs> yeah. Where did you get married? Pardon? How old were you when you married your latest wife? Oh, I was old. My, my, when I met my father-in-law, I said, I don't, I don't want to call you a father or son, he said. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's amazing? And, and, and then I told Wilford Brimley, you know, Wilford, he's, he's a character, that guy. He's a, he was a Jack Mormon. He was a bodyguard for Howard Hughes. He sings jazz with a band. He's a very interesting guy, wow. yeah. Wilford Brimley. When I came up, I said, you know, Wilford, I got this young woman that's much younger than me. Everybody thinks she's too young, this and that. He said, let me tell you something, my friend. The worst thing in the world for an old man there's an old woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. oh, now you it. you do have people. You have a much wider, uh, uh, inter, you know, interest than most actors, right? Most actors, I think, hang out with other actors or whatever, or go to parties or whatever. That's okay. That's okay. I I, I like a good Hollywood party when I'm out there. We live in Virginia, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, My but wife's you, from Argentina, but she said Virginia for her is the last station before heaven. Ah, oh, that's nice. He wow. loves it here, and uh, you know we like the. I love Texas, but we like living in Virginia at the moment. You know. Yeah. And how do you keep up with a young lady like that? Oh well, I don't know. <laughs> she, she, she keeps me going. She looks after me well. Here's Checked what I was. Me, here's what I was telling me. Kevin uh, during the break. I was saying, you're 80 years old, right, sir? Yeah, I'm 80 years old. Right. Now I see you when you're interviewed. You're a you don't look. You don't look eighty at all. You're powerful and you talk. But then you can do parts. Like I saw. Uh, I remember in Convicts. That's where I thought you looked the oldest. Yeah. You looked like a real eighty-year-old guy. Well, that's a, that was another Horton Foot script, and and the, and the director of Tender Mercies, who did not direct that, liked that movie so much he gave it as Christmas presents to his friends. That was a nice film that a lot of people didn't see. Oh, that was but a beautiful But you know, I, movie. I had a wonderful career of four, four or five 
movies with Horton Foote, and then I had the, the also with Coppola. And had, had I never done anything but those two guys' works, it would have been a wonderful mini career for me. There were yeah. two, two yeah. wonderful, talented people that uh, you know gave me gave me great parts and everything. But it was great working with Horton. You know how many people you have. A friend for fifty years, for God's sake. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's a, nice. That's yeah. and, then, and then the movie of Get Low that I did it was so. Uh, I love that movie. My wife loved it so much. I wanted Horton to see that before he died because it reminded me of, of his work. But then he died before it came out. Oh. And wow. when I was doing the final speech for the audience, my wife was off camera and she got a she got a a, a telephone message that Horton had just died. Oh. Wow. When I was doing that speech about death. Yeah. Wow. So ironic. It was like. Full circle from from tender Mer- from To Kill a Mockingbird, you know. That's yeah, it. and that's also interesting that wow. you were doing the speech and get low, and in in tomorrow uh, you uh, in the last scene were in a, a coffin. Yeah, I was yeah. Also yeah. in the coffin in, 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 in yeah. Well, you mean in the convicts? I was in the coffin. In convicts, yeah. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. Wow. So but, who was who did convicts? Uh, who directed that? Uh, yeah. Pete Masters, and that was. Uh, the Horton's first cousin, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. Right, that, yeah. That was an amazing movie, and that was a a, a character that was, uh, I guess he had dementia. Yeah, yeah. I played him like one of my uncles moved to Texas from Virginia. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, then, and I sat on a grave and, whose grave am I sitting on here? <laughs> and, and, and I made that up. Horton, Horton would sit under the cameras. He'd write. i say, Horton, could I try a little, change a little? i go, ahead, Bobby, that's okay. Then he'd watch it. they say, cut. He'd go back to writing something else. But he didn't mind if he changed a little something, you know, not yeah, yeah. so much the text, but he was great to work with Horton. He was a, really an actor's friend and ally. Some of these yeah. directors you work with are, are, are an actor's enemy. Yeah. 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 Well, Tender Mercies was the best movie ever, but I remember a line in Tomorrow that was so cool. I just uh, remember it now. I'm, I'm going to screw it up, but it was when uh, they come and take the boy from you. Yes. And you say... Do you remember the line? You, no, s- uh, uh, you once say you refresh my memory. It's been a long time. You say uh, uh, I expected it. Uh, yeah. I reckon that's why it took me by surprise. Yeah, I think that was scripted, though. Yeah, with Horton, wonderful line. Yeah, yeah that was you know, I wouldn't see that movie for a year. I was so ticked off at the producers and everybody. They cut a scene where I ride on my mule thirty miles to see that son when he's grown up. He, I say his name, he doesn't recognize me. I take off my hat wow. to, to see if he'll recognize me. Then he doesn't. And I get in my mule and ride and go back home 30 miles. Wow. And I had a great, great, great moment. One of those moments I got so emotional, I couldn't even speak. Yeah. And they cut the scene. Oh. oh, that is interesting, because in that movie, it is a little choppy at both ends. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, you know, I won't go into the reasons why that could be, but, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah. overall, it was, it was a good experience, and it's always great, yeah. was great working with Horton, you know. Do you yeah. have other scenes that, that have been cut that you wish were not? Yeah, probably. I, I can't think of any right now. Let's hope Billy Bob doesn't cut any of mine from this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm but glad this, to hear that this, this Billy a, Bob is, this is directing. This the most unique script I've probably ever read, the one. Jane Mansfield's Car is the name of it. Billy oh, Bob. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, the people, he, he, sent, he sent the script to the same people that financially backed Seven Days in Utopia. He never heard from them because a lot of the preachers will not come see, see this movie. Of course, if they come, they might like it underneath. See, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, it is so secular but so accurate. Yeah, you can't, you can't. Like a guy called in a faith-based station called in when we were doing publicity, and he brought up the fact that in the Old Testament, there's a lot of R rating. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yes. And so, yeah. uh, you know, it's uh, the secular in the as long as it's done accurately and 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 beautifully. It can be a little, uh, uh, you know, a little uh, shocking to some people, but as long as it's done well, as Billy Bob has done, I think, in this movie, then then it becomes a valid statement of filmmaking. Right. Right, right, right. right. When you do a movie, since uh, uh, Gus McRae was such an incredibly fully realized character and uh, so great, then when you do Broken Trail or Open Range or anything like that, are you? Uh, do you have to try not to go into that, or is it a? You know what I'm saying? Uh, what do you mean go into it? What, well, is it a tough thing to try to match that because they're they're similar characters? Well, similar to a point, to a point. Yeah, they are. I I actually feel that uh, if if you look, looked at Broken Trail in its entirety, I think it was better made than Lonesome Dove. Really? Oh. I, I mean, Lonesome Dove's my bad, but it's right up there, you know, and it's it. it, it 
And somebody said, you know, this and that. It's not a faith-based movie, but it's a wonderful movie in that these guys saved five Chinese girls from servitude and prostitution, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the original no. script, and uh, and it was uh, it was really nice to make. But, you know, like with, with Lonesome Dove, you get seven hours to develop a character. And a lot, a lot of actors won't do do TV because you you do TV in your career and you try to get out of it to get into features. But then once you get a certain leverage, you'll go back to do something like Lonesome Dove or Stalin, you know, uh, yeah. uh, in television. And uh, television can be great. Yeah, yeah. still action and cut. I mean, you, you're playing characters, so uh, mm -hmm. but you do have sometimes more time to develop a character. And you know, westerns are my favorite movies. They always, they always go like, westerns are dead, and then a western. No, they're not dead. People great. say that, but people always look for them, and they're yeah. always doing them. They're, there's a mm -hmm. flux of a, a bunch coming back for TV now and everything. There was they a should. there was a great uh, western a couple of years ago, about, uh, big with a big long title. Remember that movie, Kevin? Uh, the, the coward. Uh, uh, oh, the coward. Jesse James, uh, Jesse James and the James, coward. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was interesting. Did you ever see that? Yeah, I thought it was well done. Yeah, yeah. yeah I thought that was amazing, and they had no yeah, music. The, the, the guy did good playing Bob Ford, but Lucas Black would have been terrific too. Boy, he would have been great playing that part. Yeah. No, I I, I like uh, some of what uh, Brad Pitt does. Did you ever see him do the movie Snatch? Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's he was fantastic. Awesome. That he was, was fantastic awesome. playing that gypsy. Because I, I know a little... But I, I directed a movie once called Angelo, My Love, where I only used one professional actor, and all the rest of the actors were American gypsies, and they were terrific natural actors. But, you know, Brad Pitt, I think, went up to Northern uh, uh, Ireland and, and picked up that lingo. It was terrific. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Duval, for Thank all your time. You're awesome. Thank you, Mr. Duval. And, uh, and uh, say hello to Dennis Miller and tell him the uh, next time I expect to talk to him. What the... <laughs> Dennis Miller Show. <laughs>